There are so many images and descriptions of angels that we see in literature, in art, in the movies. We've all seen the paintings of, of these little fat, little chubby children with wings flying around. We've seen pictures of angels as soldiers with wings and, and javelins and swords. We've seen interesting images of angels. Even in the movies we see them. Sometimes the, they are indistinguishable from people. Sometimes they are soldiers with magical powers. Sometimes they're little old cranky, annoying men who don't have wings yet, as in It's a Wonderful Life, Clarence the Angel. It's, it, angels uh, are the butt of jokes and misunderstanding. Fundamentally, angels in, in Scripture and in Hebrew theology, angels are kind of on God's staff. They're not formal human beings who've died and gone to heaven. They, they're on God's staff. They're employees of the management created for specific purposes, to be messengers, to be defenders and soldiers, to have specific jobs and duties, to be the choir up in heaven. Yeah, we're not going to go into that one yet. <laughs> we have fascinating jobs and responsibilities, and here today we see an example of one, of the angel doing his job. How we conceive of angels and what we expect from angels varies, however. And so often, I believe, we run into angels and we don't know it. One day I was on a trip in Europe. I had just traveled from the north to the south in Poland and had finally reached uh, the eastern part of Poland and had, uh, was in Warsaw. The people who had been conducting me on my trip had left and I was waiting in the Hilton Hotel in downtown Warsaw for, um, I, I, to get a room. I mean, international travel is strange, and sometimes they don't have the rooms available when you get there, and you gotta wait, and you gotta wait, and you gotta wait, and you gotta wait. So I'm sitting in the lobby of this hotel, waiting for my room. And as I'm sitting there, I'm sitting on a couch, and uh, there's a, like a coffee table in front of me, and I've got my bag on it, and my iPad's out, and I've been kind of reading it, and reading my emails. Because for most of this trip, I didn't have free internet. I wasn't able to keep up with what's going on back at home in my church back in Dallas. And so I had fallen out of touch for quite a bit. And so I was trying to catch up. And, and the news wasn't good. There were lots of phone calls I was going to have to make. People were mourning the death of loved ones. Uh, my associate was helping, but it was still a difficult situation. And I wanted to call, and I desperately wanted to call. And I was hurting because I wanted to call. But it was the middle of the night in Dallas even though it was day in Poland. And as I was sitting in the midst of my frustration, this little old lady comes shuffling into the area, and she plops herself down in the seat that's kind of catty corner from mine, kind of halfway facing me. It, it, she looked a lot like Mary Means or somebody, you know, very wise and loving and just appealing to look at. And she sat there for a moment, and she looked at and she started to talk to me. She asked me who I was. Her English was perfect. I figured, oh, she must be from the United States. It was an American accent. I couldn't tell from where in the States, but it was obviously one of our accents. And, and I, I was impressed by her as she asked me questions and I was answering, but the weirdest thing was is that usually when I'm in conversation with people, I ask them questions about themselves. Not this time. She was compelling in asking questions. And then she said to me suddenly, she goes, you look really upset about something. What's wrong? And so I started to explain about how I'd just gotten a bunch of emails with regards to some deaths in my church and some situations back home, and I couldn't handle it. I couldn't deal with it right then because here I was in Europe, and it was half a, half a planet away and a completely different time, and they're asleep, and I can't call, and I'm frustrated and anxious to answer these needs. And she kind of smiled at me and began to counsel me on how, well, there's nothing you can do. They're asleep. You need to wait at least four or five more hours before you can even bother trying to call them. Calm down, rest, get in your room, get settled in, 
don't worry about it, it'll take care of itself, and when the time is right, you can call. They understand where you are. Don't worry about it. Don't fret about it. Amazingly, it's the kind of things I would have said to myself if I would listen to myself. It took this little old lady encouraging me and counseling me to say, don't worry about it. Don't fret about it. The time will come when you can call. About that moment, the person at the hotel front desk called my name. So I got up and left the, 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 the lobby seating area and I went across to the, um, to the, to the hotel desk. I, I said, could you watch my stuff here for a moment, please? And she said, sure. So I went over to the hotel lobby desk and they said, we, we, the good news is that we have a room for you now. Two and a half hours in advance of when, of when you should have been able to get it. There, there are advantages to being a Hilton Diamonds member. And so they said, here, here's your room card. You can go on up to your room. Whew. Wow. At least I can get up there and get relaxed and settled in. So I turned around to go back to the lobby area where my stuff was and the little old lady was because I was going to say, hi, thank you so much for watching my stuff and thank you so much for talking with me and encouraging me and blessing me, being a pastor to me. But she was gone. And I was disturbed because there's no way she could have hopped up in that length of time and gone all the way out of there without anybody noticing, especially not me. So I turned around and I asked the, the guy at the desk, what happened to the little lady that was sitting next to me? And he had this strange look on his face and he said, what little old lady? You've been sitting alone for a half hour. And you felt that chill go down your spine. Like someone's walking across your grave. Remember that old story? Ooh. Was she an angel? She doesn't conform to the standard pictures of angels. Not a fat little child with wings. Not a soldier with weapons. Not like we see here in Daniel's uh, version of, a, of an angel where he is standing by the, the, the river of Tigris, the Tigris River in exile, and he looks and he sees a man. This is in Daniel chapter 10, verse, verse 5. I looked and saw a man, quote unquote, clothed in linen with a belt of gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, that's a green or often a greenish color uh, mineral. It's extraordinarily rich and expensive. Um, uh, his body is like beryl, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his voice was like the roar of a multitude. Wow! This is an angel of the Lord. Eyes like flaming torches. A voice like the, like the roar of a multitude. And the other people who were with him, they, didn't, they couldn't see it, but they felt this presence and ran. And he himself, he sees it. He sees this angel of the Lord, and he feels his strength leave him. And his complexion grew deathly pale. Then I heard, he writes, then I heard the sound of his words, and when I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a trance, face to the ground. He passed right out. In the presence of this angel, he is overwhelmed by the power and majesty of God, whom this angel represents to him. Another and very different image of an angel Far from a charming scene with a little chubby kid with wings. Far from a little old lady sitting with me in a hotel lobby, encouraging me, pastoring me, serving God through me and for me, counseling me. Here we have a messenger angel who's been in combat, as we find a little later on, along with Michael against another demonic force 
coming to give Daniel a message. Here today in our gospel reading, we find another angelic messenger, an angel of the Lord who brings a powerful message to Joseph. A powerful message that would change not just Joseph's life, but the life of every person who has ever lived or will ever live. Today we're going to look at this appearance of this angel and what it said to Joseph and Joseph's response. Next Sunday we'll look at the angel that appears to Zechariah and his response. And then we'll look at Mary and the angel that appeared to her and her response. And then we'll look on Christmas Eve at the shepherds and their response to the angel's message. Today we've got this message to Joseph. Now, it's an interesting message and it's an interesting response. Here he is, he is engaged to a young woman. Tradition of the church says that he's an older fella, he's in his 30s, maybe 40s, he's an old man, and he is, he's got kids from a prior marriage and his, his, his wife from that marriage has died, probably in childbirth, and so here he is, as was common in that culture today, a young lady in the town in which he lives has been uh, given, uh, promised to him, he has been engaged to her, but they haven't yet uh, consummated the deal, so to speak, and, 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 and been married. And he gets word that she is pregnant. That's a disaster, friends. But engaged and pregnant, that's a disaster. It's a disaster for Joseph, it's a disaster for Mary. But Joseph, being a kind man, he could have, he could have thrown a fit, but in, instead of that being a kind man, he decides to put her quietly away, to, to simply end the engagement, to stop the situation, say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll find someone else, goodbye, I'm not going to throw rocks at you, literally, I'm not going to attack you, I'm not going to hurt you, I'm just going to say no. He could have done that, and that's what he wanted to do, and it's what he was intending to do, kindly. When an angel appears to him in a dream and says, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. <sighs> from the Holy Spirit. From God. This child is a divine gift from God. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That phrase right there is a literal translation of the meaning of the name. In Hebrew, it's Yeshua. We translate often that name in the Old Testament. When you see it in the Old Testament, we translate it as Joshua. The name is Yeshua. And it means Yahweh delivers, Yahweh saves. That's the meaning of the name. That's the ne meaning of Jesus' name. Yahweh saves, Yahweh delivers. You shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what has been spoken by the by the Lord through the prophet, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. That's kind of strange. It's like he has two names. The second name describes how the first name achieves its miracle. Yahweh delivers because God, El, is with us, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, the with us God, the God who is with us, the God who does not 
forsake us, the God who does not leave us, the God who never stops loving us, but is always present with us, this God who will be with us in Jesus of Nazareth, this God who will be with us in this Yeshua, in this Yahweh delivers child, will save the people from their sins by simply being here. The entirety of the gospel message, the entirety of the Christ event, the Christ story, it begins with the incarnation and birth of Jesus. It travels through his life, through his teachings, through his ministry, through his calling his disciples, through his um, witness to the love of God, through his feeding and teaching, through his healing and loving of the people, all the way up until his entrance into Jerusalem and his teachings there, and then his arrest and his trial, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. The entirety of the Christ story is about God being with us, not forsaking us. It's about Yeshua, Yahweh delivering us, by being the God, Emmanuel, the God who is with us. Now, if it had been me, I probably would have woken up and taken a look at my food and wondered, now who put some drugs in that? Because that's quite a dream. But not Joseph. Joseph wakes up, and it says... Simply, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife. But unlike in that day, you've got to remember, in that day, the betrothal was a public statement from the parent or guardian of the woman that this person, this, this girl, this woman is to be married to this man. The marriage celebration involved nothing more really than the consummation of it. But here he says he identifies her as his wife, but it says had no marital relations with her. That's one of those interesting euphemisms. Had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him, Jesus. Essentially, Joseph gives her cover by marrying her outwardly so she can bear this amazing gift, this God with us, this Yahweh delivers, Yahweh saves child into this world. He listens to the voice of the angel. He accepts what the angel says is true. He doesn't argue with the angel. He doesn't ask the angel questions. He doesn't do so in this uh, this attitude that it's not possible. He simply says yes and does it. May we also be graced by God with the calling to share Yeshua, Jesus, Yahweh delivers, Yahweh saves. Let us be also willing to share this beautiful Christ child. Emmanuel, God is with us. Let us be willing to share this message of the God who does not leave us or forsake us. Let us be willing to share this message with the whole world. And just as the angels shared it with them, so also we now become like angels sharing this message with all. This wonderful message about a wonder-filled life that we can have with Jesus Christ our Lord in faith, in hope, in love, and the joy of His presence. As we move through the Advent season, let us listen for the voice of the angels. Let us listen for the voice of the angels, receive the wonderful message, and then share it with all. Let us listen to the voice of the angel and say yes and follow the calling. Let me dwell in the name of the Father and of the Son.
You have been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Commerce, Texas, and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2015 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information and for other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at First United Methodist Church, 1709 Highway 24, Commerce, Texas, 75428. This program was produced by Dr. Greg Neal.